Ever look more closely at a gas pump? You may notice above some of the grades of gasoline, a may contains up to 10% ethanol. Ethanol is an example of one of today's substances, the alcohols. First off, let's look at the properties of alcohols. First of all, their functional group, they all contain the OH group. You name alcohols by adding OL to the name of, end of the name. And also you give the address of where the alcohol is. Here, one butanol indicates that the alcohol group is attached to the first carbon. Note that you can also use the name one butanol. Here are examples of a couple other alcohols. This would be two butanol because it's attached to the second carbon. And over here, I have one that's um, two methyl uh, propane two all because I have both a methyl and an alcohol group attached at the second carbon. These structures are all isomers of each other in that they all share the same chemical formula. Alcohols are represented by a common formula, ROH at the end, where R can represent a chain of carbon. Alcohols tend to be polar substances that bond very easily with water due to the presence of the OH group. It enhances the hydrogen bonding that can take place between water molecules. And also alcohols are further classified based on the attachment of the alcohol group. For instance, in my first molecule up here, this is called a primary alcohol because the carbon to which the OH is attached is attached to one other carbon here, shown in blue. A secondary, carbon, uh, secondary alcohol has that carbon attached to two other carbons, both shown here in blue. And finally, a tertiary alcohol where the carbon is attached to three others. The reason I'm going to show this is because the fate of these alcohols and how they react depends very much on what the type that they are. Alcohols tend to undergo a process called oxidation, and we've seen that before from our previous unit, referring to the loss of electrons. Here I'm going to begin with a chemical called ethanol, a two-carbon chain on the left-hand side. It is then oxidized into another compound. I can call it oxidation because if I carefully look at the carbon, I can see that the number of electrons that it essentially holds is decreasing. I've shown here in red the electrons that are trapped by the oxygen. As I move to my second compound and that oxygen forms a double bond, it withdraws electrons from the carbon. So that carbon has become oxidized. And finally, in my final molecule on the right-hand side, the introduction of another OH group indicates further oxidation as that carbon continues to lose its electrons. In order to cause oxidation, we need to introduce an oxidizing agent. And some of the most common ones include the manganate ion or the dichromate ion present in acids. We're going to represent oxidizing agents just by the O in brackets. And this also requires some heat to take place. So let's take a look at how it happens. So first of all, I'm going to begin, as I say, with a two carbon chain called ethanol, my primary alcohol. And it's a very polar molecule. Through the process of oxidation, it will produce a compound that's called an aldehyde. I recognize aldehydes by a double bonded oxygen at the end of the carbon chain. These molecules are slightly polar and can form dipole-dipole bonds with each other, not quite as polar as the alcohols. If I continue to oxidize my compound, I'll produce a class of compounds called the carboxylic acids. The carbon is double bonded to an oxygen and an OH group at the end. These molecules are highly polar. If I begin with a secondary alcohol, here shown as propane 2 all and oxidize it, I produce another class of compounds. These are called the ketones. Ketones are recognized by the presence of the carbon-carbon double bond in the middle of the chain, and this would be called propane 2 one You're typical when naming ketones to give the address of the doubly bonded carbon and these molecules are also slightly polar. If I bring along and try to oxidize it further, I'll get no further reaction. I can't oxidize this any further. If I begin with a tertiary alcohol and try to oxidize it, the process stops there. These don't oxidize. So to summarize, my primary alcohols can be oxidized into two compounds, aldehydes and eventually carboxylic acids. Secondary alcohols can only be oxidized into ketones and tertiary alcohols can't be oxidized. Let's look at how we can separate these substances from each other. 
So here I begin with my ethanol being converted to ethanol, being converted to ethanoic acid. I'm going to represent these by these abbreviated formulas that I've shown up above. And I'm going to begin with a process called distillation. Distillation will involve heating my compounds in the round bottom flask that you see on the left. The vapors from that can then rise into a condenser. That condenser has flowing through it on an inner tube some cold water, which eventually comes out warm as it takes heat away from the vapor that rises. I'm going to begin by placing my primary alcohol down below with my oxidizing agent here shown in orange, representing the dichromate ion. In the first step of the process, I oxidize it. This will cause actually the oxidizing agent to change color. It'll become sort of a green form. Now let's look at the properties of these two compounds. The aldehyde that's formed can only make dipole-dipole bonds with itself, whereas the alcohol can form hydrogen bonds, which are much stronger. So when subject to heat, it's more likely the aldehyde will evaporate, whereas the alcohol with stronger bonds will remain behind. So when this substance is heated, I will see the aldehyde rise as a vapor and flow through my condenser and then condense as a liquid coming out the other end. Now that it's been removed from the oxidizing agent, this process can go no further. So I've been essentially able to separate my alcohol from my aldehyde. But if I wanted to go further, then I need a different setup. This is called a reflex chamber. In this particular setup, I keep the condensed liquid trapped in my oxidizing container. So again, in the first step, I oxidize the substance and produce my aldehyde. That aldehyde rises and condenses and falls back down. When it falls back down, it comes in contact with more oxidizing agent. So as a result, I can continue to oxidize it all the way to the acid form. And here I form something which can make both hydrogen bonds and dipole-dipole and has a much higher boiling point than either of my two predecessors. Alcohols also undergo a process called a condensation reaction. I can take a carboxylic acid and an alcohol and subject them to condensation, to bring them together, to condense them into a smaller molecule. To do that, I need to remove a water molecule between the two, and that's shown here in the blue. By removing the H from the alcohol and the OH from the acid, that oxygen and carbon now need to form a bond, and they do so, and they link together to form what's called an ester. Esters are known for their fragrance and odors found in medications and numerous solvents. Here's a 3D molecule of the substance that I've made, and to name this, I would call it methyl propanoate. The O8 on the end is used to indicate the formation of an ester. Methyl, because it came from methanol, and propane, because I use propanoic acid. So that was a quick look, a quick tour of some of the properties of alcohols. As you can see, they have numerous types of reactions. Please don't hesitate to give me a comment. Thanks for watching.